Okay, uh, thanks for coming again. Come on in, find a seat if you're, if you're looking for one. Uh, we're going to start a new series today. Uh, we've, we've, over the summer we had something called God in the Arts. And I just want to say thank you to everybody who took part in that. We had some really great messages and uh, different perspectives, some unusual ones, right? <laughs> Um, but it, I, I, I personally really enjoyed it, I got a lot out of it, so thank you to all of you guys for uh, contributing to that. Um, and then of course last week we had the update from, from Guatemala. Um, so today we're going to start a new series, it's a series on the book of Matthew, uh, which is the first book that appears in the Christian scriptures, what we as Christians call the New Testament. It's one of the Gospels. Um, and we, we do this pretty much every summer, we pick a book from the Bible and kind of dig into it a little bit. So what we do usually, and we're going to do that today on the first um, day of one of these series, um, is just look back away from it a little bit and look at some of the context and try to um, deepen our understanding of how the book was written, why it was written, what its sort of overarching message and themes are, so that as we dig into various details over the course of the next six weeks, because it's a six week series, it'll take us right up to the fall. Um, We'll have, a, we'll have some perspective. You know, it's, it can be dangerous to, to, to dig into any text, I think, and just pick out a sentence and think that we know, what it, we know exactly what it means, right? Context defines meaning. I, I had a great example of that. When we first moved to the States, uh, my, five, my five-year-old daughter, who's now 23, went to her, her preschool class and asked her teacher for a rubber, um, which has a very different meaning here to what it does in England, and that's an eraser, you know, because we, we, you rub things out, right? Um, and so that, her teacher was somewhat shocked by that, um, because my daughter, at five years age, and the teacher had very different contexts for that word. Okay, so um, we can misinterpret one another when we have different contexts, and we can certainly misinterpret the Bible when we, have, uh, we don't have the context. Now, um, so what I'm going to do is give you my understanding of the correct context. That's a joke. Okay, so we've got, to be, we've got to be careful there too, right? But all I'm trying to say is that this is sort of true to how we approach the Bible here at Cedar Ridge. We want to approach it in a humble way, in an honest way, not presume that we can quickly understand what it all means. Because it was written several thousand years ago in a completely different language, in a very different culture. So it's going to take a bit of time, and we want to take that time and be careful with it rather than jumping to conclusions. Okay, so that's what we're going to do a little bit of today. Now we've called this series The Messianic Revolution um, because Matthew portrays Jesus as the Messiah. In fact, as the Hebrew Messiah. It's a very Jewish book, as we'll find out in a moment. He portrays Jesus as the Messiah in a very revolutionary kind of way. Um, and, and that revolutionary way is kind of, we can, that can be applied in all kinds of contexts because it's, it's pretty revolutionary within Judaism, what, what Matthew's talking about, to the point where it actually got um, this growing Jesus movement, people who later became known as Christians, thrown out of the synagogue. They were viewed as heretics. Okay, so it's revolutionary in that sense. It's revolutionary in that it's a reinterpretation of what anybody thought the Messiah was going to be. And it's revolutionary in that the message of Jesus kind of turns everything upside down. So, you know, we, that's why we've called the book, we've called the series, The Messianic Revolution. It's you know, an exploration of the Gospel of Matthew. Wow. It's, uh, does that, is that time up? <laughs> okay, we don't know what that is. Um, okay, um, can you still hear me okay? There's a buzz, but okay, you can still hear me. Okay, so what we're going to do is just look at some of this context. So we've got a few slides we're going to put up, which will just kind of back us up. So we're talking about the New Testament, the Christian scriptures. There are the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have Acts. There's 13 letters written by Paul in the New Testament, things like Romans and a couple of letters to the Corinthians and you know, a bunch of letters, 13 in total. There's some other letters, people like James wrote letters, we studied that book once. There's a letter to the Hebrews, nobody really knows who wrote that. Uh, John wrote three letters, Peter wrote a couple of letters, Jude wrote a letter. So you know, there's all these letters and writings, many of them which predate actually the Gospels. Especially some of Paul's writings seem to have come in much earlier than the Gospels. And then it ends with the book of Revelation, which we also looked at a couple of years ago. Remember we did a, an exploration of the book of Revelation uh, too. So, uh, the Gospels. So let's hone in on those. So Matthew is one of the Gospels. The Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So just, I'm, I want to say here, um, I'm not going to make any assumptions that any of us have any great depth of knowledge about the Bible. Some of us might do. Uh, but it's totally okay if we don't. Uh, we're going to be sort of talking about some things that might, for some of us, be very basic, for others it might be kind of illuminating. So we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
Um, another way of looking at those Gospels, actually, is to look at them in terms of their historical order. Okay, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the way they appear, the order in which they appear in the, in the Christian scriptures, in the New Testament. But actually, in terms of the, um, when they were written, and they were all written in the first century AD, sometime towards the end of the first century AD, um, Mark was probably written first, most people would, would accept that, followed by Matthew and Luke, and Luke and, and the book of Acts are really kind of one, two volumes of the same book, um, and that's um, clearly articulated in, in, the, in, in the actual content of the scripture. It says, you know, um, it talks about who, you know, it talks about the fact that they're connected. But anyway, and then you've got the book of John, and John is very different to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or Mark, Matthew, and Luke. John is, which we did a study on last year, right? Uh, John is written much later, and it's more of a theological um, explanation about Jesus, rather than telling the same kind of stories about Jesus and the sayings of Jesus, the parables and things like that, that appear in Matthew, um, Mark, and Luke. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are somewhat similar. They are also very different, but they are somewhat similar in that they tell a story about Jesus' life from his birth to his death and resurrection. Uh, John doesn't... Uh, John's Gospel is quite different to that. Okay, so that that's why these three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have become known as the Synoptic Gospels because Synoptic means we look at them together. Syn meaning together. It's S Y N, not S I N. Um, and we look at these together and compare them. And as we've compared them over the years, um, scholars have, have come to see that actually take, we're talking about the Book of Matthew, right? So. Mark, they're 90% of what we find in Mark, the text of Mark, 90% of it is also in Matthew. Sometimes, for great sections, word for word in the original Greek language the same. Now, Matthew also seems to edit some of what Mark says. He sort of he, he changes a few things around, and we'll get into some more of that in a second. But that's led people to believe, and this is, I think, a pretty widely held belief amongst most scholars, that Mark was written first, and when Matthew and Luke wrote their accounts, they had a copy of Mark. They had access to what Mark had written. And they, I mean, in, you know, interestingly and encouragingly, pretty much agree with Mark. They make some changes here and there. Um, but they pretty much agree with Mark, and they say, okay, um, you know, that's the basis to our story. Um, but then there are, in Matthew, 220 verses that don't appear in Mark, that also appear, again, very, very similar, almost word for word, in Luke. So it seems that when, if you think about it, so Matthew sat down to write his scripture, his, his account of Jesus' life. He's got a copy of Mark, but he's also drawing on other material. He's drawing on some material that Luke is also drawing on. Um, and there's no evidence that those two guys colluded. And, and when I say those two guys, I'm assuming it, that the authors were male. We don't know who the authors were. Um, that they've been called the Gospel of Luke, called the Gospel of Matthew, several centuries later, based on traditions. It doesn't say in the text that I, Matthew, am writing this. So we just have to you know, bear that in mind. But um, whoever the writer of Matthew is, whoever the writer of Luke is, they seem to have, both have a copy of Mark, and they're drawing on other material that they both have access to, some of them have access to. And that's become known as the Q document. It, we don't even know why it's called the Q doc, God, document. And it has nothing to do with James Bond or anything like that. But it's... It's probably either a lost written document or an oral tradition that was available at the time, and they've drawn on that, and it's sometimes called the sayings document, because it, that, those sections, those 220 verses that I was talking about in Matthew and Luke, that, are, that they share, that are not in Mark, um, they're usually the sayings of Jesus, they include the sayings of Jesus. Okay, so, so Matthew's adding those in. And then there is also material in Matthew that's not in Mark and not in Luke either. And that's called the M material. Again, nothing to do with James Bond. Um, it's M for Matthew, right? So um, it's unique to Matthew. So, so what that gives us, let me put the next slide up, is, is a sense of how was Matthew written. Well, so Matthew begins with Mark. He begins editing Mark, okay? And then adds stuff in from Q, the Q document, adds his own material. And then he kind of edits it all together, right? And, and comes up with what is eventually a much longer and quite different book to Mark's Gospel. So he starts off there and then kind of expands. Now, what's the relevance of all that, you might be asking? <laughs> why, why is this relevant to us for now? Well, it's relevant for a number of reasons, right? 
Firstly, it shows us that the Bible did, did, not, did not just drop out of the sky. All right, so often, and, and you know, certainly when, when I was growing up, I, I, I think I took this approach to it, and I, and I think most people around me seem to take the approach that, well, if it says, if it says X in the Bible, then X is true, and, 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 uh, because that's God's word, right? That, 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 and, and the assumption was it's like it floated down from the sky, and we have this sort of almost magical book that came straight from God. Well, we believe the Bible to be inspired, but we don't believe in the Christian tradition that it floated down from the sky, nor that the writers kind of went into a trance and started writing and didn't know what, really what they were doing. No, these books were written in a very human way, inspired by God, we believe, but in a very human way where they sat down with a purpose, right, with an agenda. We see that really clearly in the Gospels because we've got several to compare. So the story of Jesus is told differently by the different authors. In fact, a particular parable of Jesus, like let's take for instance the parable of the lost sheep. That's a very famous parable. We'll see that in Matthew's Gospel. It's in chapter 18. We'll deal with that in a few weeks' time. In a few weeks' time, it also that same parable also appears in the Gospel of Luke. But Luke uses that parable in a very different way to make different points than Matthew makes, okay? So we, we have to have, when we're trying to interpret Matthew, we have to have some sense of the fact that Matthew had an intention, he had an agenda, if you like. And for us to really understand the book and, and to be able to interpret it to the best of our ability, we ought to pay attention to that agenda. Now that doesn't mean that God can't speak to us sort of outside of that agenda. But we would be kind of arrogant to make Matthew mean something that it was never intended to mean, right? Would you, would you agree with that? Would be kind of, that's kind of like going off into left field. So we've got to sort of bear in mind this did not just float down out of the sky. It was written with great intention and, and care. Um, and that should not upset us. The fact that there are agendas and, and even differences and, and occasionally discrepancies between the Gospels, we shouldn't be too worried about that because we because we know that they've been written with a purpose. And I was just sharing with somebody this morning um, how we, we all tell stories different ways to make, we tell the same story a different way in a different context to make a different point, right? Um, so I, you know, I just been away on vacation. I could tell, I could say, somebody asked me, how did your vacation go? Here's how my vacation went. I could, I could respond to that person, given my knowledge of that person, and tell them something about my vacation. But if somebody else might ask me, and, I, and maybe they're, they're struggling with something, and I might want to tell them something difficult that happened on vacation, you know, just to sort of empathize and identify with them. Um, and and, and if, you, if you just took, if I wrote those two accounts down and we looked at them, you think, well, they're totally different accounts. Well, you know, he's lying. It's not true. No, it, it, it is true. They're both true. We're just telling them in different ways, right? And that's what's happened with these Gospels. Um, so we can trust these Gospels, we can trust the account of Matthew. There are, there are hundreds, even thousands of manuscripts. We don't have the original manuscripts. Okay? Um, the earliest manuscripts we have from about the 4th century. But that's pretty good for a historical document. Take documents like the histories of um, Herodotus or the um, Caesar's Gallic Wars. We only have maybe 9 or 10 manuscripts and the earliest of those is from about the 9th century. Okay? We have over 5,000 Greek manuscripts of the whole of the Christian scriptures, and the earliest ones date back to the 4th century. Okay? So we've got a, there's, there's a lot of reason to trust these. They've been handed down over generations, they've been picked over and criticized and reviewed, etc., etc. Um, you know, some discrepancies in the accounts is, should not cause us too much to worry about. At the same time, we should have a lot of respect. Okay, so we should we should we should respect what they are saying. So we can trust them, but we have to respect them and not make them do things or say things that it wouldn't be fair to make them do or say. Okay, so in that light, in that spirit, let's move forward and talk a little bit about what agenda did Matthew have? Okay, what was the agenda of Matthew? Now. Um, to do that, I'm going to sort of dig into a, a little bit of Matthew to start off with, some of the characteristics of Matthew, and then we're going to back up a little bit and talk about some of the historical context of Matthew, and then we're going to kind of put it all together and say some things about the overarching agenda of Matthew. Okay? So, let's, so we're going to dig in a bit, step out, talk about history, and then jump in again. So let's dig in a little bit. What are some of the characteristics of the book of Matthew? Well, something that you notice right off the bat, 
Okay? And um, if you read just the first four chapters of Matthew, which includes um, the story of uh, Jesus' birth, which is, incidentally um, does not appear in Mark, okay? So Matthew, uh, uh, an immediate difference you notice between Matthew and Mark is that Matthew adds in a whole section about Jesus' birth um, and adds in a whole section at the end about Jesus' resurrection. Mark just pretty much starts off with Jesus as an adult meeting John the Baptist. And he ends with an empty tomb. No discussion or talk about the resurrection, just an assumption that Jesus is out there somewhere. Matthew, on the other hand, is kind of de doing away with some of that mystery. He adds in a piece at the beginning to say, here's where Jesus came from, and it includes loads of references to Hebrew scripture. Okay, so you may remember if you've been around here for a while that when we, we, we usually tell these stories at Christmas, the birth of Jesus, um, and you know, it, that we read even passages from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, that allude to the birth of Jesus, and some of those appear in Mark, and Mark sorry, in Matthew, and Matthew will say, this was, you know, Jesus was born this way uh, to fulfill this prophecy or to fulfill this statement in the law or whatever. It's, there's lots of references where Matthew seems to be going out of his way to make the point that Jesus fits with the Hebrew predictions about the Messiah and that Jesus is, is very much a, um, part of and in, in sync with the Torah, the law of the Hebrew people. So it is a very... Jewish book. It's a it's a uh, very Hebrew book. has that has that sense. An interesting thing to notice actually is that the um, uh, there's lots of references to Hebrew customs. There are also references to Hebrew customs in Mark. In Mark, he always explains them. He always explains, oh well, this custom was done because of this. So he so Mark seems to be writing to at least a more universal audience, not an exclusively Jewish audience. Matthew doesn't give those kind of explanations, right? Matthew's explanations are all about proving Jesus to be the Hebrew Messiah, not explaining Jewish custom. That leads us to think then that Matthew was probably writing to Jewish people who knew the customs, understood the customs, and he's trying to make this point about Jesus. Okay, he's trying to make a, a, a very clear, very taking the mystery away. Jesus is the Hebrew Messiah, fulfilling the Hebrew law and the Hebrew prophecy. That seems to be that a, a, a very strong characteristic within within uh, the book of Matthew. And um, uh, there's also included in Matthew, and to be fair, in the other Gospels too, but especially in Matthew, conflict in the stories of Jesus with the Hebrew authorities, particularly conflict with the scribes and Pharisees, okay, the people who were like the guardians of the law. Pharisaical Judaism was Judaism based on, what, which put high value on Torah, high value on the law. Um, the Sadducees, another sect of Judaism, we'll talk about some of these sects in a moment, they put their emphasis on the temple, the sacrificial system. All right? but the, 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 and Jesus had some conflict with them, but not a whole lot. If you read Matthew, all the conflict seems to be with the Pharisaic, Pharisaical form of Judaism, which put all the emphasis on the law, the Torah. Okay? So it seems that G this, the G gist of Matthew is to portray Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, and it's almost in opposition to Pharisaical Judaism. Now that's kind of relevant, we think. Um, and I'm going to, as I said, when I come, I'm going to jump out in a second into some historical context, and then come back, and we'll see what the relevance of that is. Um, okay, one other thing we can mention is that um, in, in the characters of Matthew, we don't know who wrote Matthew, right? I said that at the beginning. All the Gospels are anonymous in the actual original, well, we don't have the original documents, but as close to the original documents as we have, there's no authorship ascribed. Uh, by the end of the second century, the tradition of evolved, had evolved that, that uh, the first gospel was written by somebody called Matthew, and hence it was called Matthew's gospel. And if we put up the scripture, Matthew 9.9, 9, um, there's a little story in Matthew. This is the reason why Matthew, the name Matthew is ascribed to this gospel. There's a story about somebody called Matthew. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. Now, why would we say because of that story that we should call the book Matthew? Well, um, the same story is told in Mark and Luke, except the guy is called Levi in those books. 
So the fact that the name Matthew is used here has at least made that association with the book, and some even would say that they think it was this guy, this Matthew, that wrote this gospel. I've got to say, I personally don't believe that, okay, because I think if it was Matthew, we would get a lot more uh, sort of first-person narrative in the scripture. I, we, I think um, we'd get um, more we, like we went to this place, or we gathered around Jesus, we saw this. There'd be more eyewitness kind of language, and you just don't get that. It's very third-person, all right? So, you know, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it, 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 but I, I'm not so sure that it was that guy that's called Matthew, but it's a tradition. It's become known as the Gospel of Matthew, and it's, it's better than calling it Gospel 1 and Gospel 2. I think, you know, the Gospel of Matthew is great, and there's a character called Matthew in it. Now, let's think a little bit about what was going on at that time, around in the first century, when these Gospels were written, and in particular when we were homing in on the Gospel of Matthew. I mentioned earlier that there were different sects S-E-C-T-S, sects within Judaism. Okay, there were, and I think we have a slide. Yeah, yeah. so we, I mentioned a couple of them already. So at the time of Jesus, um, there was a lot of variation, a lot of different views within Judaism itself. There were the Sadducees, who thought the most important thing was the temple and the sacrificial system. Okay, so they were very much associated with Jerusalem, where the temple was. And they were very much associated with the aristocracy, for, for obvious reasons, being in Jerusalem, and the temple represented a lot of power. Um, the Pharisees, on the other hand, their emphasis was on law um, and the Torah. And, and their, their hero, if you like, was Moses, the giver of the law. And they took the law very seriously, and they believed that if you lived the law, if you followed the law, that you would experience everything that God had for you. And in fact, the law became the presence of God to them. The written word was like God's presence with, with, with God's people um, to, to the Pharisees. And the scribes were associated with them because they were the ones who would write the law down and sometimes interpret it, but you know, pass the law on. The Essenes are something we, we you know, probably, I don't think that word's used once in the Christian scriptures. Sadducees and Pharisees, you know, we, they're in various stories about Jesus. The Essenes aren't, but they were another group. A, a, an ascetic group that withdrew, the kind of monastic movement, withdrew to the desert. Um, they, they had a sort of quite apocalyptic view of, um, of Judaism, and their emphasis was on the land, the holiness of the land, and the land belonging to God, that sort of geographical area. Um, and then we have the, the zealots, who th there, there were religious connotations to the zealots, but essentially they were a political movement. And they were the ones that were opposing Roman domination. Okay, so the Roman Empire had taken over this part of uh, the world, um, first century Palestine, uh, and the Zealots were, were fighting the Romans or trying to get people to rise up against the Romans and push the Romans out. So they were a political movement that wanted to install a king over Israel again. Now, a fifth sect that we could throw in there after the time of Jesus is Christianity. Right? Christianity wasn't called Christianity initially. It was a movement of people who believed Jesus to be the Hebrew Messiah within Judaism. Progressively, Christianity became more and more un-Jewish, or more and more Gentile, um, for a couple of reasons. One was because the message started going out to non-Jewish people. And we see some of that story played out in the book of Acts and even in the letters of Paul, how this goes beyond the initial Jewish context. Another reason it became more Gentile was because the, uh, these early Christians, let's call them Christians because that's what they've become known as, were in conflict with the Jewish movement, with the Jewish people. Let me talk a little bit about some of that conflict. I think it's probably not hard for us to understand that there might be conflict because these, the early Christians had this very specific view about Jesus being the Messiah and some other views that really kind of went against traditional Jewish thinking at that time. Um, but maybe we can just put that slide back up again. So the one before that. Uh, so let's just think about how some of this conflict evolved. Okay, so we've got these four different groups plus Christianity. In AD 70, um, a very famous thing happened in, in, in Hebrew history, and that was the destruction of the temple. You may remember, actually, when we did the book, we talked about the book of Amos, we mentioned how in the 6th century BC, <coughs> The Babylonians destroyed the temple. Well, they rebuilt the temple, only for the Romans to destroy it again in AD 70. 
And, and this was because the zealots kind of encouraged, were able to amass enough support to start a pretty significant rebellion, and the Romans crushed it. And the Roman sort of t tactic at that time was not to come in and just deal gently. It was like they, they were actually fairly gentle during peaceful times. But when things you know, got bad, they would just come in and just wipe everybody out. And that's pretty much what they did. And they, they destroyed the temple, destroyed Jerusalem. And from that time on, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, would, would um, scattered throughout the world, and we had the Jewish diaspora, that was the beginning of the Jewish diaspora. Okay, so AD 70 was a very significant time. Now if you think about it, what's going to happen to the Sadducees post AD 70? Well, there's no temple, right? So that form of Judaism really can't survive. It's very hard to continue on, that form of, Ju that form of Judaism. Same with the Essenes, they don't have the land. The Essenes also threw in their lot with the zealots towards the end, it seems like. And the zealots were all about power and military power and political power and kingship, and that's all gone as well. So really, the only form of, Hebrew, of Judaism that could survive that kind of destruction was the form that held Torah, a very portable, uh, mobile symbol, um, that held that as its, as its central theology. So uh, post AD 70, it was Pharisaical Judaism, or what's become known as Rabbinical Judaism, that prevailed. Plus Christianity, because a resurrected Messiah is also pretty portable, right? You can't destroy a resurrected Messiah. The Romans couldn't do that. So we have these two groups, one fairly powerful at that time, the uh, more established, the rabbinical Juda Judaic movement, within which is this very small movement called, which became known as Christianity. And we believe that Matthew was probably written around the time when Christians were being put out of the synagogue, okay? So that's why there's some of this conflict in the, in, uh, the pages of Matthew and why Matthew is uh, talking about Jesus the way he does, which we're gonna describe in a second. It's because it was written at a time when the prevailing religious thought seemed in conflict with what they believed by conviction, which, that, which is that Jesus is risen from the dead, Jesus is the Messiah, and that was costing them, to, in some instances, their lives, but it was costing them also their belonging to community. So Matthew is written to a community of people that are being persecuted, that are, being, that are questioning their identity, and, and it's reinforcing to them why, why they believe what they believe and why it's worth believing. And Jesus is the central element to that. The, the, who Jesus is and what Jesus does is, is the most controversial thing. So Matthew's written almost like a, a treatise. It's using all these stories about Jesus and, all the, and quoting Hebrew scripture and, and using the sayings of Jesus to make the point that Jesus is the, is the Hebrew Messiah. That as Jewish people, you are not wrong to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Now we've got to be careful, I think, when we interpret Matthew, and we talked about this with, with the Gospel of John as well, that some of the conflict within the Gospels with the Hebrew authorities, has led to anti-Semitism, right, on the part of Christians, right, down, down through the centuries. Really appalling things have been done. We, that's, I, I would say that's an incorrect interpretation. When, when um, the, uh, there are statements or sentences in Matthew, or any of the other Gospels, that seem to criticize the Jewish religion, I think what we, take, we should interpret that as is as criticism of dominant uh, oppressive religious author authorities. All right, so that's the context in which Matthew was written, it, and and view it in, in, in the contrary as a, an elevation of Jesus as the Hebrew Messiah. Okay, so as we go through Matthew, we'll touch on that a little bit um, uh, from time to time. But that, that's some of this context. So we think Matthew was probably written around AD 85, something around there. That's the most widely accepted time after Mark was written, after the temple was destroyed, at a time when there was a lot of conflict going on. So, let's go back into the book, okay? So we just sort of stepped out into some historical context. Let's jump back into the book now and talk more about this agenda, so we can put the next slide up, more about this agenda of Matthew with those two. We've talked about some of the characteristics of the book of Matthew. Can we put the next slide up? And uh, some of the historical context, and then, his, so here I want to talk about three ways in which Jesus is portrayed in the book of Matthew. Okay, you still tracking with me here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of, yeah. Okay. Uh, 
So, um, three ways. Now, I'm going to describe these as, almost as though uh, they're so obvious in the book of Matthew, and they're all kind of wrong. Really. Jesus is portrayed as the Messiah. He, he fulfills Torah. He fulfills Hebrew prophecy. He's, he's, Jesus fits the bill in the Jewish context, okay, according to Matthew. Um, Jesus is also described a lot in Matthew as the Son of God. That's language used a lot, which kind of is language used in Hebrew scripture for the Hebrew people. So Jesus is almost like the epitome of the Hebrew people. It's like he's the, he's the expression of what Israel was meant to be in, in, in Matthew's terms. Okay, so Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is also teacher. Um, Jesus is rabbi. Now you can see that this would be, all of these things would really inflame rabbinic, a rabbinical Judaic, um, Judaic mindset, uh, the Pharisaical mindset. Okay? And by Pharisaical, okay, that's become now a term for hypocrisy, right? That, it's, that's how it's used. But I, when I'm saying Pharisaical, I mean Hebrew tradition based on um, Pharisaical Judaism. Okay? So, um, Jesus is teacher. He's portrayed in the Gospel of Matthew as the one truly worthy to interpret, he, to interpret Torah. Okay, so he's the rabbi of all rabbis. Okay, rabbis interpret Torah, and Jesus is the rabbi of all rab rabbis. It goes even further than that, though. Jesus is portrayed not only as the teacher of law, but as the giver of law. We'll see in a second that Matthew really writes his story about Jesus to portray him as like a new Moses, who was the giver of the law right, for the Hebrew people, right? That was, he was the, the, uh, the person who got the Ten Commandments and, and is believed to have written the first five books of the Bible. Um, and then Matthew, not only, not only that, Matthew um, has Jesus, um, he sort of structures his book around five discourses or five sermons. So if you, if you read Mark's Gospel and then read Matthew straight away afterwards, one of the major differences is that in Mark's Gospel, you read narrative primarily. It's like, Jesus did this, and then he went over here and did that, and he said these few things, and then he did this, and then he did a miracle, and then he went over there. And sometimes Mark is a little long-winded about his stories, but it's all story, it's all action, it's all moving forward. With Matthew, there's narrative and story, and then you get a pause, and five times, it then Jesus then just talks. A um, little bit like me right now. <laughs> just keeps going. And then he, then he finishes, and then there's a bit more narrative going, and that happens five times. I mean, you've only got it once today. But um, uh, Jesus, and, and some people think that those five, the reason Matthew includes these five discourses is in comparison to the five books of Moses, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, at the beginning of the Hebrew Scripture. So we'll come to that in a second, um, before we wrap up, about Jesus being like a new Moses. And the third thing about Jesus is, okay, so he's, he's Jesus is the Messiah, He's the teacher. Uh, he's the, the, not just the teacher, but the, like the, the giver of the law. He, Jesus is also the embodiment of Torah. It's, it's like Jesus to Christianity is what Torah is to rabbinical Judaism. Okay, I was saying earlier that to rabbinical Judaism, Torah is God's presence with us. Well, Christians believe that um, God's presence with us is through Christ. Christ is present in, in, in flesh and blood in, so God is present in flesh and blood in Jesus. And after Jesus' death and resurrection, he's present to us by spirit even now. So that quote, the word became flesh, is not from uh, Matthew, that's from the Gospel of John. But that principle is still there throughout Matthew, that, that Jesus is God's presence with us. Now, we're going to take a look at the, there's a couple of scriptures here. One at the beginning and one at the end of Matthew that serves bookmarks, I think, uh, book holders for, um, for the book, book as a whole, um, that illustrate this point. You, were, you may remember this, we, we read this uh, passage pretty much every Christmas, in which you'll find this verse. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Okay, so Matthew sets out saying, Jesus is God with us. At the end of Matthew, and in, 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 we'll deal with this passage in six weeks' time, um, Jesus sent his followers out, um, and, he, and he said, Teach them everything I've, com I've commanded to you, and surely I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus is present now. So to, if God was present in Jesus, Jesus is present with us now. So Jesus is like the embodiment of the way of God as opposed to um, us just relying on the, on the written word. So th this is 
This, these are very strong themes throughout Matthew. And we're going to touch on these as we go through. And we're going to, um, in, a, in a second, we're going to kind of just reflect a little bit on what's the relevance of, of, of these things for us right now. But as we touch on different themes throughout the gospel, let's bear this in mind. Let's bear this background in mind of, of how revolutionary this was, how radical this was, how offensive even this was. Um, blasphemy. You know, it's no wonder that the Christians were, were um, being kicked out of the synagogue because they're making claims that in many respects are outrageous. Uh, let's just, maybe we could um, jump onto the next slide. I just wanted to, as kind of an aside, there's a uh, sort of a little DVD extra over here. Um, <laughs> talk about Jesus, Jesus is Moses. Okay, so I th uh, th I'm not the first person to notice this, by the way, <laughs> um, by any means, but I, I think there's a lot of credence in this view that Matthew's portraying uh, Jesus as a new Moses. Think about the story of Moses. We may have heard that uh, back in Sun School, if you ever went to Sun School, or, you know, um, you may be somewhat familiar with that story. Moses was born um, at a, as a Hebrew person when the Hebrews were enslaved in Egypt, and they were at that time killing all the firstborn males. So he was hidden away. So there was a persecution story around uh, Moses' birth. Well, the same thing happened with Jesus, right? Jesus was born and Herod tried to kill all the babies. So there's a comparison there. Jesus' family flee to Egypt, which, and th that means when, they, when he came back to Palestine, he had to come from Egypt. Moses came out of Egypt, like uh, leading the uh, people of Israel out of, out of captivity. Um, Moses led them through the water, the Red Sea. Jesus, in chapter 3, comes to the River Jordan, goes gets baptized in the River Jordan and passes through the Jordan onto the other side where lo and behold there's a wilderness just like there was when Moses led people through the Red Sea and Moses and the people of Israel were in the wilderness for 40 years uh, Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days and nights um, and then at the end of all that Jesus goes up a mountain and uh, gives the law. He, he gives what has become known as the Sermon on the Mount. He starts to reinterpret Torah. He, say, he, he says, you have heard this, but I say this. And he kind of reinterprets things and, and says some other, other new things too. Um, so Jesus is on a mountain giving the law, just like Moses went up Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments. Okay? And then Jesus, the, uh, Matthew constructs Jesus' teaching around five sermons, just as Moses' law is, is based on five books. Okay, so I don't think it's a stretch to see that Matthew is portraying Jesus as, as this new Moses who kind of, who, who, who is a greater fulfillment of everything that God has for us. Now, um, let's just look at a couple of other verses from um, chapter five and chapter seven. I'm gonna skip a couple of slides here, Melinda. Um, so, I just said Jesus goes up a mountain. Um, so we have, in this first section of Matthew, the first four chapters, Jesus is born, he flees to Egypt, uh, he gets baptized, he's tempted in the wilderness, and then he goes up this mountain and he delivers his first sermon. Each of these discourses that we're going to look at, because we're going to look at one or two of these each week. Now we're only going to dip into a few verses, right? You'll be pleased to know. <laughs> because um, they're pretty lengthy. We're just going to, but we're going to touch on each of these five discourses each week. Each of them begins and ends the same way. That's how they're kind of marked off. Um, so in chapter 5, verse 1, it says this, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and I think I forgot to put the second verse in here, and he began teaching them. It says he began teaching them. That's how every sermon begins. The disciple, Jesus sits down, the disciples gather around, and he begins teaching. Okay, so that's a signal. Oh, here come one of the five discourses. Um, notice how, you know, uh, rabbis sat down to teach. So Jesus is being portrayed here as the ultimate teacher. He's coming in, sitting down. It's his, here's the true rabbi, if you like. And then he starts talking about Moses' law and reinterpreting it. I mean, it's pretty radical stuff. It closes in chapter, at the end of chapter 7, this sermon, this first one called the Sermon on the Mount, because it was on the mountain. Uh, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. So every discourse ends with the words, when Jesus had finished saying these things. So that's a cue to us, oh, that sermon's over, he's moving on to narrative. Now, in this particular ending, notice what it says. 
the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he, is, he taught as one who had authority, not as their teachers of the law. I mean, how inflammatory is that? Right, basically, he's, I mean, that's a pretty provocative statement because basically the writer of Matthew is saying Jesus is a better teacher than all these other interpreters of the Torah. Okay, so, you know, no wonder there's a little bit of conflict here, right? We, we just need to bear that in mind again as we, as we go through it. But we, we're also seeing here Jesus elevated as the, the culmination of Torah, the culmination of law, the culmination of the, the um, story of the people of Israel, the culmination of... Um, messiahship. Jesus, Jesus is in, in Matthew's gospel is elevated to this really high level. And we as followers of Jesus, as if you like children of this movement that became known as Christianity, that's who we're following. Now that brings us, I think, to um, we're going to conclude here. It brings us to, to reflect on a couple of things. Um, and I encourage you, by the way, just to sit down, just read the first few chapters of Matthew, kind of get a feel for some of these things that I've been talking about. We also have, I don't have a copy here, but we have discussion questions um, for each of these weeks, okay? And they're online, and we've got hard copies out on the table in the, in the lobby. So um, if you, you could do those on your own, or if you're in a small group, uh, there'll be great discussions questions for a small group. And actually, one of the questions this week um, it includes a passage, I put a passage in there from Matthew chapter 3, and I, I put it in one column, and then the same passage from Mark and the same passage from Luke in there, so you can compare them. There's some questions about, you know, why, what are the differences here and why? What does this say about what Mark's trying to say and what Matthew's trying to say? Yeah, it might be interesting. Maybe not, but you can check, check that out. Uh, but I think the, the, the other question is going to dig into a little bit more of what does this mean to me? Okay, so I'd really encourage you to look at those. Um, and by the way, we're going to have a discussion each week in here at the front of the church for anybody who'd like to. If, you, if you're not in a group, or you're not, you, know, you haven't been able to get in the group yet, uh, or you just want to come along and have a discussion, we'll, we'll just chat through those questions uh, at the end of the service. So I'll be up here doing that if you'd, like to, if you'd like to join me. But let's just stop for a moment and reflect on some of the things that we've been talking about. I think that most of us probably don't have too much of a struggle um, thinking about Jesus as rabbi, thinking about Jesus as teacher, okay, when we think about the different ways Matthew portrays Jesus. Um, you know, it's, it's some, I, I think, somewhat easy to relate to someone like Jesus in the way that we might relate to someone like Gandhi or uh, Martin Luther King or other people who have had some great moral teachings. Um, you, know, uh, you know, we could relate to Jesus that way and think Jesus was an amazing person and he, you know, we could look at five discourses and say, there, just amazing teaching. The Sermon on the Mount, I mean, you know, when Jesus talks about forgiving and forgiving people and loving our enemies and just revolutionary, radical stuff that it's very easy for us to read now and think, oh yeah, that's Jesus. But I mean, just amazing stuff. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, love your enemies and forgive. I mean, it's just pretty amazing stuff, right? And we can think of Jesus as this great teacher. And Jesus is a great teacher. And we spend a lot of our time here focused on Jesus. Um, the teacher and following the teachings of Jesus and taking those seriously. I think it's a little harder in our culture, in our mindset, in our uh, you know 2,000 year, 2, years of intellectual development to think about Jesus in the same way that they saw Jesus as God's presence with us right now, as the embodiment of God and the presence of God. That's a little harder for us to relate to, because we can't see, touch, or feel. Sometimes we can, it seems like, but most of the time we can't see, touch, or feel Jesus. So relating to Jesus in, in, in the more mystical, personal, um, somewhat subjective way, I think is more of a challenge. Gee, we're going to have communion then, right? We're going to take communion together. And it's, I think it's a, an, an apt time for us to reflect a little bit more on that aspect of Jesus in, in Matthew's Gospel. Um, God's presence with us now. Lo, I am with you always, is what Jesus said. And um, as we, you know, um, in one of the passages uh, towards the end of, of Matthew, we have Jesus gathering with his disciples for the Last Supper, where he breaks bread and drinks and gives them wine as part of the Passover meal at that time. And you know, since that time, we're in this tradition, which started off as a very small, tiny 
pretty powerless movement, which became known as Christianity, which has, but has since become this incredibly huge, big, uh, at times in history, very dominant religion. Uh, but through all that, through all the ups and downs of that, and all its good and bad and ugly, and all its mistakes and all its successes, and all its wonderful things and all its bad things, people have been taking communion. We're about, I'm pointing over here because we have bread and wine up here. 